I do want to uh, tell you that the first scripture, the Psalm 150, is often called the musician's psalm. That will become clear to you when she reads it. And the Luke passage is also fairly familiar. It is Jesus identifying himself and by, by so doing, uh, quoting Isaiah. So listen for those things. Good morning. The scriptures for today are from Psalms and the Gospel of Luke. I will begin with Psalm chapter 150 in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Um, let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And now Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 20. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Word of God for the people of God. So I've often been asked, what were you thinking? What were you thinking when you wrote that poem or lyric or song? And I must confess that sometimes I feel a bit like Gandalf the wizard from Lord of the Rings. The usually taciturn, tight-lipped wizard was being unusually forthcoming to Pippin, the most inquisitive of the hobbits. And he had many questions. Here's the scene. But I should like to know, Tippin began again, Mercy, cried Gandalf, if the giving of information is to be the cure of your inquisitiveness, I shall spend all the rest of my days answering you. Somewhere else he says something along these lines, that question demands a lengthy answer or none. I can resonate with that sometimes. Actually, I don't mind the question at all. It just gave me an opportunity to quote J.I.R. Tolkien. I don't mind the question at all, but in truth, the answer is a bit hard to express. But since we're about to sing a song that I wrote the poetry for and Adam masterfully wrote the music for, now seems as good a time as any to give you a glimpse of the process. You see, for me, poetry and lyrics and melodies seem to flow out of me as if I were discovering them, not creating them. This can be triggered by a single thought or a moment or it can well up out of a kind of mental soup in which feelings and observations and thoughts have been stirring and stirring in my mind. Then suddenly an idea forms or a trigger event happens and I feel I must write it down. The trigger for Midnight Reverie was the result of a rear event, a real event, as I shared with most of you who came to the pre-concert talk on the night we first premiered this piece. But late on a clear summer night in East County, a friend and I were standing on the edge of a large pool of water under a star-strewn sky. There was no moon and the Milky Way stretched across the heavens. The pool was so still and the sky was reflected in the water so clearly that it looked like we were looking down at our feet at the stars. It was so intense that both my friend and I had a sense of vertigo. I felt like I could fall into the sky at my feet. So when Adam suggested we work together on a song and he wanted lyrics from me to inspire him, 
I thought of that moment and wrote the first line, stars lie captured in a quiet pool. And the rest of the poem just flowed. I named that moment a midnight reverie, which I took to me in a reflective moment, a moment of contemplation tinged with a sense of wonder. As I has always thought that reverie meant that. Adam's music beautifully creates the mood I was trying to express, and I'm so very grateful for this creative collaboration. However, every once in a while, the dictionary will humble you. For it was only this week that I finally got around to looking up the word reverie and discovered that its primary meaning is daydreaming. And daydreaming itself is defined as a series of pleasant thoughts that distract one's attention from the present. Wool gathering, some call it. Get your head out of the clouds, others have said. Wasting time. Daydreaming. So much for my clever attempt at titling. However, Adam, you will be pleased to know that a 20th century philosopher by the name of Gaston Bachelard came to our rescue. Bachelard is described as one of the most wonderful philosophers of the 20th century, by which the biographer meant a man full of wonder. I would have liked to talk to this man, for looking at the world in wonder is one of my core values and deep pleasures. In his book entitled The Poetics of, Re of Reverie, which I could not resist reading, Blaschlar wrote this. Reverie is not a mind vacuum. It is rather the gift of an hour which knows the plentitude of the soul. Thank you, Gaston, for that's what I meant by reverie. Blaschlar goes on to say, in contrast to a dream, a reverie cannot be recounted. To be communicated, it must be written, written with emotion and taste, being relived all the more strongly because it is being written down. I'll leave you to decide about the written with emotion and taste part, but I absolutely endorse the importance and the joy of writing down moments, feelings, thoughts, poetry, and songs that come from the gift of an hour which knows the plentitude of the soul. And I firmly believe that plentitude of the soul moments are holy moments, moments in which the Holy Spirit draws near and touches our spirits. Another wonderful writer and poet, Maya Angelou, has written this about those holy moments and the words and music that flows out of them. She says, poetry and music are the best at the highest level of the human mind. Out of poetry, out of our need for poetry, human beings have developed the idea of God. And so when we sing, when we dance, when we speak poetry, we are speaking out of God's mouth to each other, out of the music from God's heart. The poets and musicians and kings and scribes and other authors of the book of Psalms were doing just that. You heard it in Psalm 150. They were speaking to each other and to us the music from God's heart. And respectfully, I would turn Angelou's image around slightly and suggest that rather than speaking out of God's mouth, God is speaking out of their mouths and hopefully at our best out of ours. And that my friends is another reminder that what we say matters. The words that we use matters. Being faithful to the one who called us into being matters. Offering the love of the son by our expressions of faith matters. Allowing the Holy Spirit's words to flow from us matters. On this day of musical proclamations of our faith and spiritual plentitude, we are, in my belief, doing exactly what the psalmist suggests. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We would like to offer to you now Midnight Reverie.
As you heard in our second scripture, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord is a phrase from that book of Luke chapter four. Jesus is speaking here as a prophet and cites one of the prophecies of Isaiah. He has sent me to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. 
The acceptable year of the Lord is a reference to the year of Jubilee, a special year in the Hebrew tradition that was celebrated every 50 years or so. The year of Jubilee was a holy year that marked a time of God's grace, redemption, deliverance, and a promise of peace. The beginning of the year of Jubilee was announced by the blowing of a ram's horn, hachilbel, in Hebrew, which is where the word Jubilee comes from. Jesus proclaims that he has come to announce the spiritual year of Jubilee, which through him would mean canceled debts, forgiven sins, liberty, freedom from slavery to sin, and restored property, relationship with God, and eternal life, reconciliation, a new start, and a chance for peace. Peace is such a simple word, and yet it is one of the most elusive experiences in the human condition. We struggle to find it both within and without, and I think it's that internal struggle that matters most. How do we find peace within ourselves? Speaking of a year of Jubilee, it was about 50 years ago that I was privileged to hear a prophetic voice in a Lutheran church in San Diego at the invitation of a friend. The church service was hosting a speaker who called herself Peace Pilgrim. Some of you may have heard of her. When I met her, she was a delightful, energetic, white-haired woman who was walking across the U.S. for the cause of peace. I think it was on her third journey. She became Peace Pilgrim on January 1st, 1962, when she renamed herself, inserted herself in front of the Rose Parade, handing out flyers and, and introducing herself as Peace Pilgrim, wearing her tunic. That was the beginning of nearly seven journeys across the country carrying the message of peace to anyone who would hear her. She had chosen a life of utter simplicity. She owned only the clothes on her back and a few personal items, a notebook, a pen, a toothbrush, and a comb, which she carried in the pockets of her tunic. She had come from privilege. In the 1920s, she was a flapper and a fashionable woman of her era, including all the jewelry and furs. But on a walk in the woods, she became aware of a call on her heart. She began to divest herself of worldly goods, and as her life grew simpler, her calling became clearer. And by 1962, she had made the choice to become a pilgrim for peace. She achieved national attention as she made her walks. Hers was an inspiring story. Her experience was full of the goodness of people. Although she carried no money and would not accept any, nor did she solicit or accept funding, she usually was offered a bed on most nights, and she rarely went more than two days without a meal. Her story was fascinating and inspiring to hear, but it was her words that stayed with me. Here are three thoughts I want to share. Firstly, she said, when you find peace within yourself, you become the kind of person who can live at peace with others. The key to peaceful living is peace within. For her, it was necessary to simplify her life and to find a purpose to adhere to. That's what gave her inner peace. And once she did that, she became the person she longed to be. The second is perhaps her most famous quote. It's the one that made it to a wall poster status of the 1970s. A wall poster, for some of you out there, is the meme of the 1970s, by the way. And this was her statement. This is the way of peace. Overcome evil with good, falsehood with truth, and hatred with love. This echoes scripture, of course, and many other prophetic voices over the years, but she was very careful not to claim any specific religion. She would say that her message for peace is for everyone. And lastly, I particularly resonate with this statement from Peace Pilgrim. In an interview, she once said, one little person giving all of her time to peace makes the news. Many people giving some of their time can make history. That, my friends, is a call to action if I've ever heard one. Peace Pilgrim's simple, seemingly simple statement places the responsibility for peace right where it belongs, on all of us, all the time. To bring peace, we need to find our inner peace, 
We need to work for good in the face of evil. We need to speak truth to falsehood, perhaps now more than ever, and we need to keep love at the center of all we do. In the words of another great prophet, Dr. Martin Luther King, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And when we do that, we will begin to feel the deep peace that Peace Pilgrim found and shared with all that would listen. We will feel the deep peace that Christ doesn't just offer to us, but in my belief, the deep peace that Christ actually is. Christ is the peace we seek. Being Christ-like is the peace that truly passes understanding. We are about to sing a wonderful new setting of an old text by one of my favorite new composers, Elaine Hagenberg, in addition to Adam, of course. It is simply titled, Deep Peace, and it begins with the line, Deep Peace of the Running Wave to You. The most famous of this rendition of this text is a choral setting by well-known composer John Rutter, and it's called a, a Gaelic Blessing. And you've likely heard it if you've been at this church more than a minute. I believe we've sung it at least once or twice a year for my entire tenure. The text, A Gaelic Blessing, belongs to the oral and written tradition of ancient blessing literature that finds its roots in Scotland, Ireland, England, and Wales. Rudder has said that his English-only composition is based on an old Gaelic rune, and that he added the line mentioning Jesus and the word Amen to make it a Christian anthem. But actually, most of the surviving prayers with this structure in both Gaelic and English already include Christian elements. I love ancient texts that are timeless, and this poem certainly qualifies. We humans have been seeking peace, offering peace, and blessing each other with peace for millennia. The desire for peace predates Christianity, of course. These words, anoint my hands to work for peace and harmony, is from a 5,000-year-old Egyptian text, one of the prayers to the goddess Ma'at. What all of this says to me is this, peace. True peace, inner peace, is not a skill we can acquire or a goal that we can attain. Peace is, I believe, a moment of surrender to a holy state of being. Allowing the love God has for you to flood your being with, with certainty and grace. It's like that moment in the ocean when you are just beyond the breakers and an incoming swell will carry your feet up off the sandy floor and you float free and almost weightless, suspended and buoyant. Peace is being immersed in God's spirit so fully that regardless of circumstance, you are safe and free. And it is in that blessed peace that you can truly offer peace to others. Peace is a God thing. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. My friends, we, you and I, are the children of God, and I believe that we are called to be peacemakers. If we don't do it, who will? Immerse yourself in God. Immerse yourself in the Son of God. Immerse yourself in the presence of the Holy Spirit and surrender yourself to become the messengers of peace you were created to be. Deep peace of Christ to you, beloved friends. Amen. Amen.